Our new series is called The King Has Come. If we could boil down the meaning of Christmas, the Advent season, I think it could be boiled down into this phrase, the king has come. The one we have been waiting for has come to the ones who have been waiting. And so I want to uh, speak to you today about the concept that God reveals himself in humility to humble people. I mean, think about it. How God came was over the top humbling for the creator of the universe to come to his creation. And God reveals himself in humility to us. God is always looking for the overlooked. He's always looking for those that are far off and forgotten. God's kingdom is established. He's the king and he's coming to establish a kingdom. And his kingdom is established uh, through unlikely people like you and me. And so today we're going to see what God has to say to us. Let's pray. God, right now we give you this moment. We give you this time for you to speak to us. And I pray, God, awaken us and help us awaken others, God. I pray, God, that we see you in a brand new way. In Jesus' name, come on. Everyone said, put it in the chat. Amen, 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 and, and amen. The king has come from eternal glory to a humble existence. A uh, couple years back, I got the chance to go to the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, in Israel, and I had a, a pretty unique experience. As we were driving into Bethlehem, it was amazing to see the whole countryside was filled with shepherds and caves. 2,000 years later, as the sun is going down, I'm looking into the Bible. I'm seeing it happen in front of me. It was an incredible experience. When we arrived at the site of where they believe Jesus was born, this is one of the more documented sites in all of Israel. Pilgrims have been going to this location since 100 AD, and there were multiple churches there, two different churches built on that site, and the church that's there now is the oldest church in Israel, maybe the oldest church in all of the world built over the site where Jesus was born. It's called the Church of the Nativity. And it's a stunning church. Beautiful pillars, stretches out in all different directions. Stunning altars. Uh, Some years back, there was an earthquake that uncovered the original mosaic floor that was put there uh, in the year 300. And it's this beautiful work of art you know, glorifying Jesus. And, and there's gold paint and there's tapestries and incense. And, and when you walk in, it, it just lifts your heart up because you're saying, this is, this is stunning. This is astonishing. This is big. This is large. But you know what's interesting is as big and beautiful as this church is, the door to get into the church is only four feet high. It's called the door of humility. In order to enter into the church of the nativity, you have to enter in in a posture of humility. I think that this is a great picture of how Jesus came to earth. Think of what he left. He left a kingdom. He was and is the king on his throne, surrounded by beings, worshiping 24 seven, saying, holy, holy, holy. The elders, the authorities up in heaven, casting their crowns before Jesus. He lived in sinless perfection, total communion with God and the angels. It was unbelievable and unparalleled, yet he chose by himself to enter in to humanity under the door of humility from large, to small. The creator comes to the creation. You know what's interesting is the closer you get to the spot where Jesus was believed to be born in the church of the nativity, the, the, the smaller it gets. You, you have to go underground and you go into a place called the grotto and, and it gets smaller and cramped. And then underneath the grotto is a star and, and in there is a cave. And if you want to see where they believe Jesus was laid. You got you to get there on your hands and knees. It's a procession of humility. Wow. And this is what Jesus did by coming to earth. He, he came through a procession of humility. And he came to establish a different kind of kingdom 
than anyone that has ever seen established before. Kingdoms were established out of power, out of might, strength, economy. But here he established his kingdom out of humility. And those kind of, the, the, the people that he comes to are unlikely people and normal people, people like you and me and God, Jesus, he exchanged heaven for humanity so that one day humanity could be welcomed into heaven. This is the great exchange. This is why Christmas is so powerful, so mighty. The fact that he came with one mission and one purpose to die so that we might have life. Think of it. Think of the sacrifice of him even coming before he even died, just his coming, what he gave up so that we might have him. Think of it. Look, look, at, look, at, look at this phrase, that God would give up his rightful place so that those who had no right would have a place. This is what the story of Christmas means. This is what it's all about. This is why we celebrate it and why it's worth celebrating. This is why it's so much more than just the gifts or just the songs or just the presents or just baby Jesus. This was a cosmic event and it had high costs and it was so powerful in the choice that Jesus made for you and me. In Philippians, it says this. It says that for us to have this mind now among ourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, because this is what he did. Who? Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, the savior becomes a servant. The king with the throne becomes a man in a manger. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He's saying that the whole process of Jesus coming was a process of humility, culminating in the cross and the grave, but the one that willingly laid down his life will now be venerated and glorified through all time because he did what no one else could do and what no one else would do, yeah, yeah. that we might have heaven. And so, so we see this theme of humility and extends throughout the whole narrative of Christ's birth. And that's what we're going to look at today. Through the book of Luke, we're going to look at a couple different characters that show up in the process of Christ's coming. And we're going to see the strand of humility that's woven throughout the entire tapestry of Jesus coming to earth. Let's start with the first character that is to meet Jesus, the messenger. Every king has a kingdom. Every king has a court. Every king has a messenger. When a king walks into a room, he doesn't just walk in, he's announced first. When a king comes into a city, he doesn't just waltz in, he doesn't just show up, it's never undercover, he's proclaimed first. There is trumpets, there are sounds, there are proclaimers, evangelists, people that go forward and say, make way, the king has come. Here we meet the messenger, the one that's meant to go before the king. And where do we meet him? What is his name? His name is John the Baptist. We meet him in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Here we find Mary, who's, who is uh, uh, pregnant with Jesus in her womb, meets Elizabeth, her cousin. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about this. The first person to react to the presence of Jesus Christ was an unborn person. The very first reaction from anyone on planet Earth was a reaction from the womb to the presence of God. John the Baptist could sense it. The Bible says he leapt with joy. This was a spiritual happening that was going on. And so, and so the first person that God chooses to react hasn't even been born yet. God considers the ones that humanity doesn't consider. He looks for the ones that are overlooked. 
God knows that throughout history, even to today, it is the ones in the wombs that most times are overlooked. It is the infants. It is the children that many times society would disregard in pursuit of themselves and, and, and their own um, and humanity's own advancement and our own careers and, and our, our, our own bettering of ourselves. And so God says, I'm going to put emphasis where I want to put emphasis. The first person I'm going to reveal myself to is the one in the womb. Why? That's where my value is. And it reveals that calling begins even in the womb. We know this out of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.5, where it says, before I even formed you in the womb, and it's God who forms, I knew you and I called you. I want you to know God knew you, God formed you, and God has called you. Just as he did with John the Baptist, he does with you, and he will do also with your children. John would go on to announce the coming of the Messiah. He would go on to prepare the way. He is the voice that Isaiah prophesied, the voice crying out in the wilderness, make way, here comes the king. And John the Baptist was so powerful. The Pharisees and, and the people, they could tell something was unique about this man. And they came to him and they said, you must be the Christ. Are you the one we've been waiting for? Are you the Messiah? And he said, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Moses. I'm not Elijah. He says, the one that comes after me is greater than me because he came before me. He's the king. He's speaking about Jesus. And so we meet this messenger in the womb, but he, he lives out his calling as proclaiming the coming of the king. And, and, and I, I think this, if I could speak to what this means, what it speaks to me about is God's emphasis on life, God's emphasis on children, God's emphasis on family, God's emphasis on those that many times are forgotten. And, and we as a church, I can speak for awakening, our goal is that the family and children would be seen, yes. considered, valued, and blessed. Amen. Because that's who God comes to. Amen. And God considers. And God loves. Through We Heart Lives, that's one of the things we try and do. Every month we do a different event to bless the families of our community that are in need to be blessed, that the children might not be forgotten. Th this year, we're doing something really unique. We are buying presents for the children of those in prison, here in our local prison. We're, we've gotten connected with them. That's been on our heart for quite a while. And we're able to buy presents for those who are in prison so that the children don't have to suffer, but that there might be reconciliation, forgiveness, and that we could be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to those many times overlooked and not considered. That's what the church is called to do. But fathers, you're called to consider and to commit to that child. You're called to consider that child's mother and commit to her and together raise them in the way of God. Why? Because God values them. I pray that you don't commit or consider your career greater than that child. I pray the value gets put on them first. What am I saying? I'm saying men are called to raise sons and daughters. Men are called to be responsible. We're called to give our very best to our families, not our leftovers. Why? Because the first person that God comes to is them. So they're our number one. Mothers, I want to encourage you, trust God with your children. I know many times, looking around in society, you might say, what, what's going to happen with them? Can I encourage you, trust a good God that he's looking at your kids from the womb all the way through. He considers them. He knows them. He loves them. He's called them. Raise them in the church. Raise them around God's people. And I believe that God will not allow them to fall by the wayside as long as they have a praying mother. Be praying for your children. Be committed to your children. Raise your children. And, and let me add one other thing to the parents. Don't ever be afraid to change as, you, as God reveals himself to you. Don't ever be afraid to ask even for your kids for forgiveness. This, this is the process of God revealing himself to you, and it takes humility to change. But pride will always keep you stuck. 
You know, it's amazing. We see that with John's father. Right at the beginning, he doesn't even believe that John is possible because of his old age. And so the angel says, until you change and until you believe, you don't get to talk because I want anyone speaking to speak in faith. What am I saying? I'm saying that God has a grand plan and God considers the one many times that we consider the least. May the church consider those who are coming up next with our very best. Bible says this in Luke 145, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. God has spoken to you about your children. I pray that there will be a fulfillment of the words that were spoken over them. And let me say this as well, and I'm gonna move on to the next point. But if you have not had words spoken over them, speak those words over them. Speak the word of God over them, the word of faith over them, and get them to church around mothers and fathers in the faith that they might have those words spoken over them. The next characters that we meet in this story are the witnesses. These are unlikely characters. These are shepherds. Now, we know that they're shepherds because we've heard the story because we watched Charlie Brown, but we are missing how cataclysmic of a choice this was, how unlikely of a choice, how far off this would be, how if you were gonna choose anyone to be witness to the greatest event in human history, you would not choose the shepherds because they were the ones that were deemed by society unworthy. But you know how the story goes. When this king comes, he comes in unlikely ways to unlikely people, so he chooses the shepherds. And these shepherds are off in a field and all of a sudden the angels show up and, and it is a, um, it, the portal to heaven opens and the, the, the angel armies and the, the, the choir of heaven shows up, which, I mean, must have been mind boggling to these shepherds. Just absolutely, un- they've never even seen LED screens. And now all of a sudden they're looking at heaven. This is unreal. And then this is, this is what the word says. In the same re- region, there were shepherds and they were out in the field And they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. Of course, we would be too. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you, come on, good news, of great joy that will be for all the people. Look at that phrase, for all the people. That is a good phrase. And I want, I want to say this, side note, that's a good brand. That is a good brand. I'm telling you, that will go. If anyone wants to make t-shirts or whatever, that's your new brand, just let me know, send me something. For all the people is a microcosm of the gospel. It's a microcosm of the gospel. This holds within it the seed of what the expanding gospel is called to be. It, it, we, we see everything In that one phrase, this is who it's for. Not for the select few, not for the best, not for the righteous or the religious, but for all the people. Not just for those in Israel, not just for those who lived at that time, for all the people. Not just for those that have been to church or know what to say, but this is for you. You get to receive the gift of life because Jesus came for all the people. That is good news. That is good news of great joy, and that is for you. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I've I, I sh- I done too much, or I'm, I'm, I'm discarded, or me, I wasn't there, or, you know, this doesn't fully connect with me because, you know, um, I, I, I am unworthy. Can I tell you a little bit about the shepherds? The first thing we see is that they are far off in the field. They weren't there. They weren't at the altar. They weren't ready with expectation, like this is the night. I read the word, I looked at the constellation, I saw the new star, I'm here, I'm ready. I brought my faith. That was not them. These guys were minding their own business and they were far off. They were in the distance. This is good news if you are far off from God. Like the prodigal son, the Bible says, when he was a long way off, this is the gospel. Even when you were a long way off, in the distance, far off in the field, away from God's coming, God came for you. And he will extend his hand out, even many times 
by miracles, by conversations, by messengers. And, and some of these angels that are coming to you, they might not look like glorified angels. They might look like your aunt, but they are sent by God for you to receive a message that he is for you. He loves you. He's called you. This is for all the people. And, and they, not only were they a long way off in the distance, the Bible says that they were watching their flock at night. It was darkness. Some of you f- might feel like all that is around you and all that has ever been around you is darkness. Darkness of sin or darkness of isolation. The darkness of your own family, failures, screw-ups. The reality is the large majority of the world lived in darkness. But the day that Jesus came, light broke through. It broke through for these shepherds, but make no mistake, light comes to break through for you. And I even feel this right now that some of you feel like your mind is filled with darkness. In fact, you would even declare that over yourself, that you feel confused, you feel like life's not worth living, that you feel like there's chaos, a cloud, a shadow over your mind. I'm here to tell you the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to pierce that darkness in your mind and in your emotions. He came so that light could come into your mind. That darkness might be pushed aside, might have to flee, might not have rain. It used to rain, but there's a new kingdom here. And there's a new king who has come. And when you turn towards Jesus, you turn towards light. You know what's so amazing about coming to Jesus? You get enlightened. You begin to think differently, live differently, feel differently. Sometimes it happens in a moment, in a burst. Sometimes it happens like a slow sunrise, but make no mistake, if you come to Jesus, light comes to you. These shepherds were a long way off, covered in darkness, but God knew them, considered them, saw them, And he came to them. And Jesus will come to you. He comes to me. He comes to us in our difficult periods. But one thing I got to give credit to the shepherds is they were keeping watch. If you're searching for God, if you're keeping watch, if you're praying, if you're waiting, if you're hoping, God will come to you. And we see that these shepherds got the revelation of Jesus before anyone else. (laughs) Before the kings found out, before Rome knew, before any miracles were done, God comes to the shepherds. And the problem with coming to the shepherds is the shepherds were the untrustworthy people. Do you know that that the shepherds' testimony wasn't even allowed in court? They were so untrustworthy, their reputation was so bad, all they were were thieves and robbers, that if you were gonna gonna choose anyone as witnesses, you don't choose the people who aren't allowed to stand and bear witness. And God says, those are my guys. You won't accept them in your court, but I'll welcome them into the king's court. It might look humble. There's a donkey and there's a manger and it's kind of cold, but this is the court of the king. And from this place, a great movement will go on into the end of time. And who gets invited? The people that no one else would invite. The people of poor reputation, counted out by man, but counted on by God. Their witness was revoked in court, but it was received in the king's court. Jesus says, come to me, which is good news for you and me, because it doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter where God found you. And it does not matter even what you have done. Grace comes and covers that and gives you a new chance and a new start. Look at this this verse in 1 Corinthians. It says this, brothers and sisters, think of what you were When you were called, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential or influencers. Not many of you were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things And the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. What is he saying? He's saying, 
God came after us, not because of our genius, not because of our finances, not because other people would be influenced by us. God came after us because he wanted to show this is how I do it. I do it all by myself. I come for the unlikely people of no reputation that no one else would trust. And I take them and I use them and I change them. So don't start boasting after you're blessed. Don't forget where I found you. A long way off, in the field, covered in darkness, not trusted by anybody, but God says, these are my guys. I'm gonna change you, I'm gonna transform you, I'm gonna let you in to the greatest story ever told. And just because you weren't there that night does not mean you're not invited in to that moment. God says, I'm coming to you. And, and even more than that, God says, and by the way, I'm gonna become like you. I am the good shepherd. I am the one that will lay my life down for my sheep. In other words, I'll not just rescue you. I'll change who you used to be. <laughs> I'll recover your reputation. I want you to know today God's desire is to reveal himself to you. God's desire is to reveal himself to you so that you would know God, that God would know you, that you'd have a relationship with God, that it would be real, and that God would begin to change you from the way that he found you. And there's hope in that. Let's look at one last cast of characters in this story of Christmas, who God reveals himself to. At this time, Jesus has been born. And it was customary for the Jewish children to be presented at the temple after eight days. And so they bring Jesus into the temple. And there, they meet two people. One's name is Simeon, and one name, one's name is Anna. These are the servants. The messenger, the witnesses, and here are the servants. Can you see that God is he's building out like a court as if, they're, as if he's still the king? Here's the proclaimer. Here's the nobleman to witness. The shepherds, us. And then he says, and here I'm going to bring the servants, the, the prophets, the seers, the ones that would come and speak over children when they were born in the court. But you know what's interesting is he doesn't bring in the high priest. Isn't that who you would bring? He doesn't bring in the nobleman. He doesn't bring in Herod the king. He doesn't bring in those of stature. He doesn't bring in the Levites, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. God brings someone named Simeon to Jesus. Someone named Anna. And these were two that were dedicated to God. They were unknown by anyone else around them, but they were known by God. And they were brought to confirm what God was doing um, throughout history. And, and these, I, they were given this privilege, I believe, because they were expecting to see God. I think there's something powerful that happens when you begin to expect to see God. That's faith, and that gives God something to work with. Right. And, and, and look at this verse. This is what Simeon, Simeon takes the child in his hands, and now he prays this prayer. He says, now, Lord, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. God had given him the word that you will not die until you see the Messiah. And he says, it's been fulfilled. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people in Israel. What Simeon is doing is he is confirming that Jesus came here to bring salvation and to bring light. My point here, I think, is really simple. But, you know, I want to encourage those of you that have been serving God for a long time to stay faithful long enough that you might see salvation. Stay faithful long enough that you might see God's word confirmed in your life. Simeon is an old man. Anna is 84 years old. The Bible tells us at 84 at a minimum, she was 84 at least 
But the translation might be that she was even far older. And, and the Bible tells, even at this old age, all day she came to the temple, she prayed, and she fasted, waiting in expectation for the revelation of the Messiah. So, so you have these people that have been faithful through generations. And there were people that had been faithful and died off and still didn't even get to see Jesus. Yet their faithfulness was like a wave crashing into the next one. And, and here comes these two that are of an older generation, but they get to see, they get to see what they had been hoping for and praying for and fasting for and waiting for. I just want to encourage you, if you've, been, if you've been serving God for a long time, stay faithful long enough for you to become fruitful. Be, be faithful long enough for your eyes to see what your heart has hoped for. God is a good God. And if your desire is to see God, experience God, God will show himself to you. Remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes? Matthew 5, he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. The servants get to see God. The meek become part of the kingdom. And this is what Jesus came to establish. In the book of John chapter one, uh, speaking about, Jesus is coming, it says this, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming to the, into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. The world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want you to know you can be like Simeon, you can be like Anna, Servants of God, in the house of God, you will see God. You will have the right to become children of God. He comes to accept you, to change you, to bless you. But my question for you today is, do you desire to see God? Do you have that expectation? He came to reveal himself, but so many people missed it and stayed in darkness. So many people that achieved much in their life, missed the thing that was really going on in that time. I pray that's not true of us. I pray you and I are ones that will be faithful for a long period of time in the house of God. You know, I just think about so many different people who have been faithful in this house, and I, I see the generational blessing beginning to build, and it took a long time. But see, that's how God works. God works generationally, and, and he works through Simeon and Annas and shepherds and it's, isn't it cool? From an unborn child in the womb all the way to this old man and old woman that have lived out their entirety of their life, God says, I came for all peoples. Yes. Amen. Amen? He's a good God. He reveals himself in humility to those that are unlikely. And he desires to reveal himself to you today. Whether you've been saved for one day for 10 years, he desires to reveal himself to you today. I would encourage you, begin to pray that way. God, will you show yourself to me? He'll be faithful. Maybe you feel like, nah, I'm, I'm like the shepherds. I'm a long way off. I've made too many mistakes. If you pray this prayer, Lord, will you reveal yourself to me? I want you to know he will be faithful and he will show himself. Light will invade the darkness of your life and he will reveal himself to you. But make no mistake, he, he's gonna come in humility. In other words, he might not come the way you expected him to come, but he will come. Stay open to God. Stay open for him to come and touch your life and change your life. That simple prayer might change your life. I would encourage you, open up the Bible. Today we went through many different chapters. Read the book of Luke. Read the story of Jesus coming to the earth and I believe it will begin to change your life. Download the Bible app. We've got devotionals on there. You can search Awakening and just begin the journey of following Jesus. And one last thing I would encourage you to do, reach out. If you know a Christian and you need your life to get right, reach out to a Christian. Find a good church. If there's no one around you, reach out to us. We want to connect with you and we want to begin to move you into a real relationship with Jesus. He came to earth and left all because he wanted you to be a part of his kingdom. It's so incredible. It's an honor to be a Christian. It's an honor to follow Jesus. I pray you see this incredible Christmas story through a new perspective of what Jesus came to accomplish. And make no mistake, he still wants to accomplish through you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. 
Thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you so much, God, for what you are going to continue to do. I pray, Lord, for all those listening to this broadcast, whether they're saved or you know, just coming to know you, maybe on their way in the journey, or if they've been faithful servants for a long time, I pray, God, you give them fresh revelation of who you are. They might see you in a brand new way. And God, we thank you that you chose us. You chose us. Though we didn't deserve it, you came after us, and we are truly grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we love you so much, Awakening. So grateful for you. and I'm so grateful for all of you that are part of the movement, on Awakening You, you know, on the apps, part of the stream. It's awesome. I think that God's doing a new thing and a great thing, and I pray that God continues to do great things in your life. Amen? God bless you.